Um, t- Toby, you should say something. Oh, yes. Nice, perfect. Nailed it. Welcome. This is Advanced Retro Adaptics, and I'm Tyler Disney. This episode is a conversation I recorded with my friends Megan and Toby. Now, I know Megan from the ERE forums, and we're in a mastermind group together. After I lost my job in 2021, she knew that I had some skills that could be useful on their school bus build, and she invited me up. So I wound up spending two months of that fall of 2021 in eastern Oregon, helping her and her husband Toby on their schoolie. Since then, they've sold their home and moved full-time into their bus with their five-year-old son Jasper. Over the recent holidays, they visited me here at Fort Dirtbag in California. So we turned the mic on and just had a conversation about bus life, money, part-time work, skills, middle-class lifestyles, side hustles, parenting, and more. I hope you enjoy it. Here is part one of my conversation with Megan and Toby. So what, what was the what was the genesis of the of the school bus build? It was it was really a shared idea. We've been together almost eleven years and within the first three months we were living together and we both have a really strong memory of going to a coffee shop sitting outside and saying should we buy a school bus now and And, and (laughs) at at the time it was it was like school bus or tiny house you Mm -hmm. know on a on a trailer platform and it was it was really i had been aware of it but it was really you that brought it in oh yeah, and at the time I remember thinking, I don't know if I can do it, like psychologically, like the my middle class upbringing. I remember, I think I said that exactly. Yeah. I think my middle class upbringing will, will be a problem. Yeah. Uh, I don't feel that way, obviously, anymore. But and but we, we did look at, on Craigslist, someone was selling a, an old dog nose bus that was partially converted, and then they ran out of steam or money, and we went to look at it, not to buy, but just to we have this idea of living in a tiny house or bus or something, but we don't have any firsthand experience of what that actually feels like to be inside of it. Mm -hmm. And so we went and looked at it and we made it clear to the guy that like, we're not buying, we're just looking. And, uh, it was, it was a real crap shack of a, of a bus, (laughs) but we, we, walked away with the sensation of yeah this is that's something that we can do yeah so the genesis was a uh, of the idea was a long time ago <clears throat> and then going on to the early retirement extreme forum um <clears throat> for a year or two um and being dissatisfied with the, our, our current situation of we owned a home it was too big for us really even though it was a modest home and one of Toby's dreams is to build one of his, to build a home, and it just kind of started to seem like something we would want to do and do it while we had um, our son be young enough mm-hmm. that he wouldn't he would just go along with the flow. So what was the what was the like why for getting the bus? I mean, I know it's like you can go on Instagram and be like, wow, that looks really cool, but. With, beyond obviously the kind of Instagram level attraction of it. So the small space was really attractive. It just seemed affordable. Like we could, we could logistically save the money to renovate something and not overly intimidating. And and, we, and wherever we're staying, we're not going to be paying seven hundred to a thousand dollars in rent or mortgage or something like that it's going to be cheaper monthly expense it feels so far away now that i kind of almost can't remember sure. yeah but for re- for the school bus over a tiny house we loved the idea of it being easy to move and not having to have another vehicle to yeah. move it yeah because if we had a tiny house the the living situation is one aspect, but the mobility is another. We would have to either have a full-size pickup or have ready access to it. And it's easier to just have it, but we don't have much of a need for it otherwise. And also with the bus, its general structure is already there. So you're starting from a place with a shell, whereas a tiny house, you're building 
yeah, the foundation that you're building up from. Not so much an advantage, but it takes out some of the, some pretty big equations in the build. As you say that, I'm wondering, because I've now built out... The, we're, we're sitting in Serenity right now, which is a cargo trailer conversion. And I that was my first real build. And then I just built a studio, which doesn't have as many services, but that was a ground-up build. So similar to a tiny house, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering which one took longer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> which one would take longer, because there's so much of like, oh, i got to fit this weird angle and figure out attachment points and stuff like that. Yeah. The, but, and I mean, it makes intuitive sense, and I, I'm pretty sure you're right about that. But yeah, I've also wondered like sometimes building ground up is like oh well. <laughs> it's a in a in a it it wasn't so much from a ease of build standpoint, but there's things that you have to figure out to make it roadworthy yeah. and structurally sound yeah. that you don't need to do on the bus unless you cut a giant hole in the ceiling potentially <laughs> structurally compromising <laughs> yeah, which we ended up doing yes. so. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's true because my studio I'm not planning on moving it anywhere it would have been a whole other thing if I was making it regularly road yeah. worthy yeah. Yeah. I really want to do a school <laughs> yeah. we'll help you I with it so much about it being drivable I just, there's yeah. such cool it's a, mm-hmm. there's there's people that that do that they'll they'll buy a bus that's not not running or barely running or something where they can drive it to the property and but they don't care about how mechanically sound it is because it's just going to be a house on their property and so they'll drive it and off you know sometimes pull the motor out so mm-hmm. now they don't have fluids to worry about right. and they just have the bus that they are living in and that's a, a really cool fun idea i yeah. love that yeah uh, where's the bus right now like where are you living right now because you sold your house you don't own any land or anything right right we um we're on a native plant nursery they have about 10 acres in a small town in eastern oregon and we we are just parked there and they let us come and go as we please and we have um, you know, we're self-sufficient as far as facilities. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Asterisk. <laughs> yeah, we're getting better at that. Um, and it's a month-to-month situation right. at this point. I think we'll stay there for sure wow. into 2023 quite a while because there's still a lot of work to be done on the bus. And it, it's, it works for us, um, this location. Um, but I I do wonder if we'll end up trying to buy land somewhere and yeah I I'm that's a an attractive thing to me I don't know about the the money part of it part of the living in the bus is simplifying and not needing to work so much to make as much money and we have some money from the sale of the house that's not gonna go very far with buying property and so uh, what that would look like if we find something uh, is really unknown. Yeah. And as far as where it is and how much it is, and you know, it'd be nice if it was somewhere in the woods where you know you have firewood on property. There's also a part of me that recognizes or has has observed <laughs> that um, most of the people I know who have land need help with the land. And so there seems to be this place where if you are a good, I don't know, tenant and you have some skills, you could really just not have the burden of the ownership or the big outlay of cash or, you know, the requirement to have a job to pay for that property and but still have access to almost everything. But there is that limited, like, the responsibility and the stability like you lose out on some stability which if if you're if it's someone else's land you mean yeah potentially yeah because mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, there's always the danger right that the relationship could even if it's really good today it could turn or they change their mind their life circumstances change and you just kind of have to go along with that and like yeah sure you've got a garden that you've put five years of work into and it's mature now but now 
you gotta go. Or yeah. Whatever. Yeah. It's always a risk. Their their grandkids are moving back into town and they need space. Yeah. Or just don't want big bus hippie bus sitting on the property. <laughs> now you mentioned you realize that you had some middle class upbringing <laughs> stuff to get over. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I think I I think I've we tried the middle class lifestyle. It just in my experience, it just kind of sucks. Like all you're doing is working and spending money and it gets kind of boring. Um, and then there's no free time. Like I had a brand new baby and I went back to work and like, it's great that Toby could be home with him, but I'm missing out on like a really precious time. And also I'm just tired. Like I was a tired parent. You would get home from, you know, working full time by then I'm beat mm -hmm. in time to pass off Jasper to you. And so you're working a double shift basically. Yeah. Just like the benefits that I feel like we were told that you would get for being middle-class didn't pan out. Like, why do I want, I mean, I liked the, we had a nice car. It was fine. It was nothing special, but it just, it wasn't enough to offset the problems or the downsides of being middle-class. Yeah, it's like we gave it a shot, it sucked, and let's try something different. <laughs> yeah. I want that on a bumper sticker. Or something. <laughs> Middle class, tried it, it sucked, doing something different. <laughs> I'm just not sure why, um, after a certain point, like if you gain enough skills to do things on your own or make your own good food, like why buying something is better like there's a probably some things out there where it's like yeah the money really buys this amazing quality but at this point like we like i can get free apples and pears and plums and have dehydrated fruit at home that is like there's just one i wouldn't spend that money at the store and two they're delicious yeah. so it's like at a, at a certain level and you know this so well tyler but like if you have some skill in your life, it doesn't make sense to like work for more money. It, it just gets to be like, well, I'd rather have the free time. Yeah. So we had Jasper, I was tired. It was just, I feel like we were really boring people at that point. And now we're so much more, not like in the <laughs> most, <laughs> in like sort of a humble, truly humble way, we're way more interesting people yeah. than we used to be. Yeah. Um, like Toby has all these new skills or he's deepened his skills during the school he build. Like I just, I can feel like I can relate to all these different people in a new way or help out or just our life is more complex and interesting than the middle class route allowed. Yeah, where we we started to uh, remodel a room in the basement and we were sort of chewing the idea of, you know, do we want to, if we ever sell the house, do we want to, you know, sell it or become a landlord and mm. maybe get a second house and just rent it and kind of be landlord and have that be sort of a side hustle. And so we were, remodeling one room in the basement and it stalled out and remained half finished for a year and a half and uh i just i realized that i don't want to spend my time working on the thing that i live in <laughs> with, with the huge caveat of living in an unfinished school bus <laughs> but that you do want to work but on. The, that that i do want to do when especially when the just not when it's 20 degrees outside yeah. Yeah. but i i didn't i discovered that i just i had no interest in up, upkeep on a house on a big house where you know you have rain gutters and you have to you know the roof has to be replaced in a couple years and yeah. you know the furnace how much time is left on the furnace and you know all, all these things that uh, kind of take any joy that there is about home ownership out and it had a one and a half car garage there was a useful workspace that had real limitations 
with power like it needed to be rewired but it's like do we want to put the the time and money into overhauling the garage to make it a more useful shop or just kind of deal with it as is and so we dealt with it because yeah you know, we we never really felt like that was a forever place yeah and i don't know if like if we had found a different house if all of these things would have been different but uh that house was always just it was fine it was okay <laughs> it was nice it was like we are we went back and forth back and forth back and forth should we rent it when we move out should we sell it should we rent it and in the end i mean really most people ugh, most people did not understand that we wanted to sell it and be totally like just cut off from home ownership and um and it feels like it is such a relief to not have a mortgage, not have to deal with any tenants. Literally, the only thing that I miss about it was the wood stove that we put in. Yeah. And it was a wonderful wood stove that uh, for a couple of years we didn't use, didn't really use the furnace. Uh, our heat came entirely from the stove. And that was really the only thing that we miss about selling the house was something that we added to it right which we can have in a school bus too mm -hmm. yeah something you're about to put in a school yes in a bus. yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Who knows? so so you don't work full-time anymore megan right i work at a hospital somebody retired and they had a three a point six position come up which was 24 hours a week and i I jumped on it. Jumped on it. Yeah, I was like in the manager's office knocking like, hey, I'm really, I'd love to have this. And I like was, you know, sussing out everybody else who might have some seniority. And, but it was kind of neat because at that point we didn't have any student loans. We didn't have a car loan. We had a mortgage and we'd had renters. Um, but I would look around at my coworkers and I was like, there's no way they can afford to go to part point six. There's no way they could do that. I, they just got a new car. Like, I knew I could have that position. <laughs> and, and you had went back from your working point eight for a while and then went back to full time. Yes. And that was a, that was a real drain on your system. Yeah, it was. But and it, was, it, was, it was longer days for everyone. Well, and at that point, it was kind of like people had COVID at the hospital and it was sort of like wartime mentality. So it was... I didn't mind that so much. I knew it was probably going to be only temporary and it was a like a shared, everybody was pulling their weight. Um, so that was okay. But yeah, so I went to part-time in 2021. I re refinanced the house, which helped. So I've been part-time for close to two years or like, you know, I'll be starting my second year. But yeah, so I mostly still enjoy my job and we are still a one income family and that is we're able to fund the school bus build and you know coming down on trips and so far i'm hoping once the school bus is finished then our savings rate will really skyrocket and i'm like i also am not ready to leave the job yet because while we have um, kind of some side potential hustles not really ready to rely on them and I also don't know if we'll want to buy land and need some you know a steady income to help raise the money for that so the job is is pretty much as dialed in as it can get at this point I think and I'm I'm ready to leave at any point if they if it turns into a super bad situation. Like I definitely have fu money and I will use it, if need be, uh, and I haven't had to, which is great. But it's nice to have that in the back pocket. That must feel really nice to know that it's acceptable, it's tolerable, it works well for what you want right now. And if it didn't, you could say, right, I'm out of here. I'll come up with something else. Yeah. I don't know exactly what. But it's not going to be. It's, it yeah. Almost, almost came close to that about a year ago. Last year, mm -hmm. it was things were, were real stupid at work. Uh, There's lots of drama, and it was it was real uncomfortable for you to go in. Yeah, and, and and Toby was great too because he was like, yeah, 
do what you want. Like we can, we can make it work. So there was a lot of freedom from him and we didn't, you know, we survived it and I have a lot of agency. So like we had bad period and I was like talking to, I was calling, cold calling like the, the hospital board president, like this needs a change and a great, and they, and they enacted some change and, you know, work is boring to talk about, but that uh so we didn't have to figure something else out but that's uh it was a great it was great to have that in the back pocket like toby's support and then the money and just would be just being able to do it to be in the position have having the savings that we could rely on getting us through a bad period if we needed it Mm -hmm. yeah and that was all you your money management and you go along with things too I go along and you have a lot of skills to (laughs) save us money like we haven't paid a mechanic in a decade yeah and we haven't paid a plumber a carpenter a mason I'm paying for a plumber (laughs) (laughs) not gonna happen (laughs) and the and the mason (laughs) I love that wood stove I did not like building the hearth (laughs) well I want to ask you Toby about like the bus build obviously that's a significant project, A, and it's also a bunch of different skills, right? Yeah. And it's also weird skills, because there's some skills that are totally specific to bus builds. Right. Then there's, like, kind of general carpentry. Then there's electrical. There's plumbing. There's all sorts of stuff. There's the mechanical of the bus itself, right? How much? Uh, I have a lot of questions. Yeah, yeah. About all this. How, how many skills did you have going into it? Or, no, 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 let me start here. What, what gave you the confidence that you could take on a project like this and like figure it out because obviously you knew you weren't starting from absolute zero and i'm interested in where you thought you were starting from skills wise right then what made you think like yeah i'll figure out whatever i need to figure out i I think a lot of it is just sort of general jack of all trades master of none i i can i can usually do a pretty good job at figuring out what needs to be done or you know, University of, of YouTube is a, a big help using other people's ideas and how do they problem solve. Um, but just kind of general, you know, ha- having some skills and being able to figure it out. Like a lot of the build was just that. It was just figuring things out. Um, I, I have worked in a cabinet shop. I'm not a cabinet builder. Um, I've I'm self-taught with welding, so I can make metal stick together, but I'm not, I'm not, I wouldn't say that I'm a good welder, but I can, I can usually make it, make it work. Um, and so a lot of it was a certain amount of confidence that I can figure it out. And if I can't figure it out, then, you know, what can I do to make it happen? I want to interject and say I think it's a lifelong <clears throat> habit of tinkering and also being a hands-on learner. Yeah. Like you will just fiddle with something, take it apart and put it back together. Like Ho- hopefully put it back together. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I think you already had that um like you are not a book learner. You're a physical hands-on learner. Yeah, that's a. It, I'm, I'm very tactile. Um, if I can, you know, I, I can read shop manuals and get an idea of how to rebuild something. Let's say, but the, you know, I learn by actually doing it. And you have a lot of patience for it too. Yeah, yeah, that, that does factor in. Yeah. And, a, you know, a, a decent amount of tools. And if I don't have the tool that I need to do something, you know, you, I usually have something where I can get it done, you know, I, to re-sign wood. You know, I was talking to your dad about it the other night where uh, I have a table saw that I can use to mill down wood. I don't have a planer or bandsaw or a joiner or anything but i can i can cut the wood and make some shavings to get the final product can you tell me more about the table saw uh that table saw has a story yeah it was you know i I got a good deal 
on a on an old craftsman saw and like like so many good deals uh there's a lot of time and money that needs to be put into it to make it really functional <laughs> and so uh it worked as is for a while um i needed to replace the motor which isn't exactly unheard of and so i replaced the motor i didn't like the stand that it was on because it was too flimsy and so i built a base for it and then the <laughs> fence that came with the saw is a notoriously poorly designed fence that you can you can use but it's difficult to use and not real practical and i didn't want to put the money into buying a Biesenmeyer style fence so i built one which was uh three weeks off of the, the bus project <laughs> so that i could just build the fence system for it but it's a much more capable uh, tool now and i can do things like resaw uh, eight quarter lumber into you know one by fours but there's there's been a lot of projects within this bigger project of the bus build of i need to i i have this tool but i need i need it to do its job better so i need to rebuild it or upgrade it or modify it and you know they always they always take more time <laughs> there's a lot of projects that need to get done before you can get the bigger project done i'm interested in hearing about some of the the materials that you're using in the bus and how you got them <coughs> and how the tools play a part in that yeah because 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 in some sense like for serenity you know almost everything in serenity i just bought you know from the store dimensioned I, I designed for it i dimensioned it i just screwed it in you know maybe cut it a little bit mm -hmm. but it was, it was easy from that perspective design was easy um and installation wasn't that difficult either because it was all just standard stuff and i just kind of clipped it together you know but yeah. your build's a little different uh we we one of the goals of the build is to try to use as much reclaimed material as possible if we could repurpose something or not buy virgin lumber in order to put up the walls or something. And so we were fortunate to be able to get a lot of uh, reclaimed wood. Um, there was a grain silo that was being uh, deconstructed and then they were selling the lumber and this was during, all, all this work was, has been done during the pandemic um and so the grain silo was made out of two by fours two by sixes two by twelves um but old growth it was built i, I don't know when in the probably the teens 20s or 30s uh, 1900s and so it was all you know fully cured or seasoned uh, straight grain dug fir beautiful wood to work with and they were selling it for pretty much the going rate of dimensional lumber but the wood is so much better and it's it's really easy to work with but also beautiful grain so you can use it for visible wood and it has interesting characteristics um, so that was one source and it was just you know dumb luck that there happened to be a grain silo being decommissioned and deconstructed at the time that we need it there was a, a train depot, local train depot that a uh, friend of a friend used to work at in the 70s and 80s. And there was a room or a basement or something that uh, was pretty much abandoned that they had to tear down. And it was, again, old growth, straight grain, clear, dug fur that uh, he was able to salvage and it's been sitting in a pole barn for since the 80s and so he let us just take whatever we wanted and so that became most that wood became the bedroom and it's this beautiful rich wood that has uh, a lot of character that you just can't you can't source that kind of wood now 
And so we were fortunate enough that we were able to have access to that. And, um, you know, there's a, a lot of materials that we're able to uh, salvage. And the flooring. At the, around the time that we were starting the build of the bus, we lived across the street from the high school and grade school. And the grade school was torn down. They had rebuilt it elsewhere. And so we were able to salvage some materials from the school. And one of the big ones was the gymnasium floor. And so that became the flooring of the bus. Uh, and, and then in the night before Toby was going to have access to get in there to do this we heard about it and it was like we heard about it on a Thursday Thursday or Friday and it was going to open up on Friday Friday or Saturday and Toby had like the hardest time falling asleep I, I he don't was think I slept wildly that night. excited <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wish I had this on video because when he was like oh in the floor your face is lit up <laughs> It was it, it was a lot of fun, and it was just fortunate dumb luck. You know, they happened to be tearing down a school at the time that we're starting this project. And how often, you know, do you get that opportunity? Yeah, but a lot of people also wouldn't <clears throat> want to do the work to get the flooring. Yeah, I, I don't know if I knew how much work was in store <laughs> <laughs> in both pulling the wood and then moving it five different times and then the actual processing of it I probably still would have done it because the the final product is you know the flooring on the bus it's one of the the big attractive features so far and uh and so we we're, were able to refinish it but keep the striping from the basketball court and so it's it's in a different order, and you just have these little splashes of color and some some red lines and black lines, but it adds a lot of character, and it's a natural finish on it. It's not a high gloss, um, so it looks very attractive. And that's nice, and it was a lot of fun doing the work. It was it was an incredible amount of time to process the wood but it was also a lot of fun and being able to work with uh, reclaimed materials is there's a joy to it that you don't get from working with new materials um, what is the joy i i don't know some of it is the wood is already very seasoned so it, it cuts more predictably uh, it doesn't move around as much um, it's there's not as many knots which knots aren't always a bad thing uh, we have some pine that has some knots and it's beautiful stuff um, I, I, I don't know I think it's like what's the difference between using a snap-on ratchet versus a craftsman ratchet you know the Craftsman's a decent ratchet that will get the job done, but the the snap on is there. There's a pleasure that you get from working with good tools, and it's it carries over into materials sometimes. See, I feel like the pleasure for me now that I mean, I you did all the work with it, but like I love the story that is in each piece of the wood, <clears throat> and I love. Yeah, it's the story of the connection to different parts of our life or different parts of the town we're in that is so satisfying to me. Plus the beauty. Yeah, but th but there is something nice about, you know, having the floor. You can get new flooring. Uh, a lot of people use either vinyl or, you know, even if you got a hardwood flooring, it's it looks nice. It, it, looks great and but you don't have the story with it yeah and when you have that reclaimed thing of something that was built you know 70 years ago it's that in itself is a is a depth to the the project that wouldn't otherwise be there yeah so the the continuation of that is 
that there's a lot of people that have built schoolies. One of the ones that we really found inspiration with was Rolling Vistas. They built a schoolie and they had zero construction uh, experience going into it. And it took them two years, two and a half years, something like that to build it. And they had this beautiful, funky 28 foot schoolie that, uh, you know, they went in without any skills and, you know, seeing stories like that. And that's just one of many um, people that have done it. Of you don't you don't really need a lot going into it. Uh, there's so much that is just spent figuring it out. I, I have had a, a sensation looking at people on YouTube who've, who've built things. I'm like, well, pff, if they can do it, <laughs> yeah. I can do it. But I mean, there, there's a lot to just the attribute of being able to look at something and be like, yeah, sure, I can do it. That's not like, like that. Is, that is a skill and a mentality that not everyone has and right. that, that that is a huge asset and attribute that i don't know if it can be taught you know some people have it some people don't i think in, in some instances also it's a bit of a uh kind of luck like if you i feel like all children are like that mm -hmm. and as a kid if you have an experience where you try something and it works out that's a positive reinforcement and you kind of go in that direction but if some of your early experiences are like oh, that didn't work out, then you might not develop that attitude later on. Yeah, so. and my, my dad was a tinker. Uh, he's always been kind of a do-it-yourselfer and tinker. I, I, I laughed earlier when Meg said, you know, take something apart and be able to put it back together again because when I was younger, my dad built a lamp. It was just like a table lamp out of an old Holly double pumper carburetor. And it was just a carburetor that he had in the garage and he built a lamp out of it. And being the kid, I took it apart and lost some pieces to it. And so wasn't able to put it back together. And my dad still gives me grief about, about that, about taking it apart and not putting it back together. So it's, you know, you, you just, I, I grew up in a household where my dad fiddled with things and built things and uh, made things work. Megan, a lot of people who are attracted to like the eerie forms, which is how we know each other, they tend to be introverted. Uh, the Myers-Briggs stereotype is INTJ, which I am, and I'm introverted. And Toby, you're introverted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Megan, you're a woman out of here. Yep. <laughs> uh, you identify as an extrovert. Can you compare and contrast your experience of the things you're trying to do with some of your ex perceptions about other people do it and like you you have certain strengths and certain weaknesses because you're an extroverted and you know it's vice versa um what are your like i'm interested in your thoughts on that um well one thing i've been recently figuring out is i don't know if it's as much the extroversion which it could be but um <clears throat> sometimes a small space is difficult or at least just being at home with the family like I want to get out and where like the way that it seems like a small space works is you the rest of the world is your public hangout and um, so that can be kind of a challenge like that that would say is like a weakness of being an extrovert is that need to be around people which can like especially if someone you're you work part-time like my demographic for people to hang out with is like retired people or stay-at-home moms and I don't know I don't always want to be around other moms <laughs> and um, like the retired there's just I don't have a big demographic and I'd like that to change, but I can't really, I can't really do much for other people in their lives. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm gonna ask further follow-up questions. So yeah. Yeah, wherever you want to go with it. Well, one other thing I've been, <clears throat> maybe you can, can, we can contrast our experiences, is that I feel like I have started with my peer group or friends or family. Like I'm not sharing some of the difficult aspects <laughs> of 
living in the school bus because for the most part they think we're kind of crazy for doing it and it, it's it is almost easier not to talk about the difficulties because I don't want to hear what I assume to be their they're like well you don't have to do this and it's like it's true this is a choice so I'm choosing to have you know to dump our urine and like figure out how to do that without spilling it all over our beautiful new floor um and also I so I wonder for you like you're an introvert does that also coincide with needing less societal approval in some ways yeah that's a really good question and I think it's hard for me to know how much of it has to do with introversion versus extroversion because versus um social circle so a lot of my friends are either dirt bags or dirt bag adjacent and so i actually you just said you often don't tell some of your friends how hard it is i sometimes don't tell my friends how great it is <laughs> i'll actually emphasize some of the hard stuff because i feel like i'm bragging <laughs> or like i feel like uh, I'm not like showing off or whatever, you know, because like I work so little and like all this other stuff. And, you know, m most of my friends are like really killing it in their careers, their jobs, their work, whatever. They're like stoked on whatever it is they're doing. And like, you know, peeing in a jar is not a big deal to them because, like I said, a lot of my friends are dirtbag or dirt, dirtbag adjacent. So I, I actually most of the time find myself not talking about the good parts. <laughs> That's funny. But 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 also about the social approval aspect, um, part of my story is, you know, from an early age, like in 1990, my parents decided to homeschool my brother and I, or early 90s, right? We were homeschooled K through 12. 1998, they bought a chunk of desert in the middle of nowhere and moved there. So like part of my formulative experience is just doing weird things. And it's like, oh, whatever you're supposed to do, definitely question that and think about maybe doing the other thing. And then my parents did that in like at least two really big ways. So I just had a lot of experiences where, um, I guess it was, wasn't, it, it was normal to be abnormal and it was okay. And like, I lived through it and it was okay. So, um, I think in some instances, I don't know how much of it is nature versus nurture. I'm just kind of resultantly wired to, want to do weird things and I have to maybe pull myself back from like talking about it too much or I don't know maybe that's just some baggage I have but I'm totally psyched doing all this weird stuff I don't have a problem <laughs> with it at all and I actually sometimes kind of get off on people who don't understand and are maybe judgmental I'm like <laughs> whatever <yes." laughs> um, and, and part of that's I mean I think part of that's just having part of that is having super supportive parents like mm -hmm. my parents have all the weird stuff that i've ever tried to do they're just totally supportive and like if you're happy we're happy and if they ever question me a little bit i can just say like well you guys started this and they kind of oh yeah you're right and it's it's cool <laughs> you know so you know in that respect i think i had it was almost like having cheat codes or like i had it really easy from a social stigma perspective because i was just raised in a kind of alternative way already so I just took that and kind of ran with it yeah it tough to do it. I look at you and I think okay what we're what we're doing with our son is fine like well, there's a guy I really think is awesome and our kid can we're not harming him mm -hmm. in doing this at this point you know we'll see when he <laughs> becomes a teenager but um yeah this is that middle class baggage that I'm still working through like I should probably see a therapist but I don't really want to at this point, but, and I know Toby has not experienced this. Is that correct to say? The kind of struggling with the stepping out of the middle class lifestyle. Not, not really. I mean, it, it, that's the sort of background that I came with, but it, it wasn't status driven or, you know, my, my parents were very, they became very middle class and they're with a lot of the middle class trappings and I guess also were encouraging and supportive of, you know, going to school or not going to school, you know, uh, after high school. Um, and there wasn't really any sort of 
perceived or expected path to follow that I felt. And so it, it doesn't really feel like I'm stepping away from anything. And I don't struggle with telling people, talking to people about it, because I don't really talk to too many people. <laughs> <laughs> there's that. So, yeah, there's... so my exposure to like people thinking we're weird is higher due to my extroversion. Yes. And yeah. also working outside of the home. I mean, Toby is still a stay-at-home parent. Yeah, um, I, I do wonder, like, if I was still at the mill and working with other people on the daily, what, what would the conversations be like? And if it was as it was when I was there, it, I wouldn't struggle with it because I didn't really, I, I felt nothing for those that I worked with. And so I didn't really care what they, <laughs> they thought. You know, we, we were not peers, we were just coworkers. And so there, there's a difference there. Um, the peers that I do have, you know, they're the ones back in Portland, they, they have a wide enough weird streak that, you know, they think it's cool. Yeah. And they're supportive of it. And it's, I, I, yeah, I don't really have the, um, I don't struggle with that aspect. Yeah. I think one of the things I realized recently is that I've struggled with sharing just living in the bus and dealing with other people's perception that it was a huge sacrifice. And like, to the point where I'm like, we've been working towards this dream for two years and I'm so excited to share these little details and you think it's a big deal to haul in water. Like, yeah. that's not a big deal. But it also is like, it's like a damper on my enthusiasm in a way. And so I feel like I've ha I have this little, we have this dream that we're living mm -hmm. and, and people think it's like a nightmare. Like mm -hmm. not having a washing machine is a big problem for people. Yeah. Or, you know, having to heat your water on a stove. If you want hot water, you, you have to heat it up on a, in a kettle. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not something that we think about, um, but it's, there are things that are very important to some people. Yeah, and, I, and, and my response at some point has been, you're working 40 hours a week, and you don't, like, we have so much freedom, partly because we are choosing to do this. Also, it's just fun and interesting mm -hmm. and cool. Like, it's fun. It's not a sacrifice at all and at this point I don't even think of the bus as a bus I just it's our home yeah. and like I have to keep reminding myself no it's actually a school bus and yeah. I don't know why I need to remind myself <laughs> at all but it it's yeah. just our home well, unfinished as it is yeah. one one thing that I've that I've noticed after moving into it is we're much closer to nature um, we're much closer to the, the daylight cycles, and it, these are all things that in a traditional housing situation, you know, the middle class household that we came from, were so far removed from. And I wasn't really expecting to be tied in into it that way, tied into the, the natural cycles. You know, I've been sleeping more in a in a good way you know just being closer to nature not having plumbing indoor where you have to haul your water in and haul it out because we don't have a gray water system and so any gray water we're taking out by the bucket and there's a lot of things like that that you know going into the 20th century 21st century you just you are not familiar with and you have to we're having to relearn all these things that are really recent departures in humanity. Um, you know, indoor plumbing and flushing toilets, you know, those sorts of things are anthropologically very recent shifts in in day-to-day day -day life. And we're more in tune with that, and it's it's kind of an experiment. You know, I mean, the whole living in the bus thing, but it's it's not... It's not off-putting, and there there's some interesting features that go along with that, like being more in tune with uh, daylight. And yeah. when it gets dark, you know, you're 
the amount of time that you spend up into the night has greatly reduced mm -hmm. and that's a that's a good thing you uh you you come you talking about a uh, introversion extroversion thing made me realize something <coughs> when you when Megan when you said that you it can be a damper to you when you share good things about bus life or the life you've built together and people don't understand it and it sounds awful to them I think I gotta change my understanding of why I only share bad things it's because I don't want people to poo poo the things that I think are great right because I recognize that some of the things that I love about the lifestyle that I'm building for myself is weird and people aren't going to get it and they're going to be like that's weird but maybe the difference between introversion and extroversion and why it's maybe a little easier can tend to be easier for introverts is because i might not have as much of a need to share it with other people like there's so much about my life that i think is cool that it doesn't matter to me if anyone knows it or not i'll just sit and I'll go, oh this is great this is great this is great and like i mean i do want to share it but like i know that i have like two or three friends or whatever that I can talk about and they're like yeah that's great because they get it and those one to three friends who are going to get it is totally enough <laughs> for me and I don't you know when I like meet someone new I don't need to like oh yeah blah, 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 this is great I'll just I'll, ju I'll just completely go in self-deprecating because it's like you don't get to know the stuff that I like so you can't hurt me yeah <laughs> yeah kind of thing <clears throat> and it's just easy for me to do that yeah, on the plus side, the extroversion, I think, like, I was the one who found the location we're at. I felt okay asking you to come help us with the build, which was amazing. And, you know, on a phone call or two, I found another lady to help us. Like, I have a lot of connections um, that have assisted us, you know, not in a kind of, like, we're sucking the life energy of somebody else out. It's just a natural uh, community building that is easier for me than it. It's not natural for Toby. Like, you know, like we were kind of saying the other night, two years into the pandemic, he, he started to feel the effects of it. Like <laughs> his life barely changed <laughs> in quality. <laughs> and I suffered a lot. Yeah. Um, but with the, like when... Tyler did come to stay with us it was it's not something that I probably would have pursued but it was not only incredibly helpful to when you were there working on it but our our work styles were very similar to where we were able to to work on it and not be in each other's way and not have to I never felt like you know I, I certainly didn't have to micromanage your work and tell you how to do things. You know, we would we would talk about the, whatever that part of the project was, and then you would do it. And then we put our headphones on. And yeah, <laughs> I'd be listening to death metal, and you'd be listening to old school punk. And <laughs> yeah, and we we just we did our our thing, and we were never we we occupied the same space without getting in each other's way. Yeah, and it was it was a really fun experience for me yeah. and it was I, I really appreciated it and that was something that that Meg brought to the table that wouldn't have happened otherwise yeah neither you nor I would have made that happen so Megan made yeah. that happen and that was awesome <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, and here we are right now and here yeah. we are yeah. yeah in serenity while it's raining outside by candlelight having a beautiful <laughs> conversation and, and Megan you're also you've written a little bit about some of your efforts uh, to like uh, community integration, which is probably not the word you use for it, but what what kind of stuff are you doing and planning on doing now? Yeah, so we live in a much smaller town now. Um, like, for instance, in Jasper's kindergarten, there's 13 kids. And um, so one of the things, come of this, a few of the ideas I'm bouncing around doing are... Um, I want to like host or help host a repair cafe and try and do so something in the community that's happened before but I also am mulling around the idea of trying to get a group of people to do like a 10 or two week local food challenge 
Um, and I, I don't have clear ideas. That's kind of what I'm building on. But I, I want to encourage, you know, local resiliency and um, support the, the area in like natural ways, not unforced ways. And, and I don't want to be in a lot of meetings either. So it's so by natural, you don't mean like uh, granola. You mean like not like a, some kind of top down thing. You know? Yeah, I want it to be sort of um, like there's already interest and like I bring a little extra energy. And um, so like to that end, I've been making like a map of where do where can you get food in our area? You know, like we can drive down the road and get a gallon of raw unpasteurized milk for three dollars. Mm. I mean, <laughs> like, I we just can never drink anything else. Yeah, we but were, like part we were of spoiled once we we're turned on. To yeah, that. it's delicious. Yeah. Um, but like also a map of where the wild. There's like a section and right as you enter town where these amazing plums are growing. They're they belong to nobody and everybody. And so I stopped and I harvested a bunch and then I met a guy and there's just, there's so much free food out there that, um, I just want to make a, like make maps and do little zines and like help generate, like, you know, my big part of my interest is like making the community stronger by ha helping people spend less money. Mm -hmm. And, um, a lot of times it's easiest with your, my own particular passion is food and harvesting and preserving. And so those are, those are some of the ideas of what I want to do. Um, and what I want my son to be around. Um, like I think anytime you have like a cool story about your food, like it's, it's fun to share it. And well, and you, uh, you got a food preservation uh, library at, at the library for yeah. people to check out um, dehydrators and pressure cookers and yeah yeah that was neat um, and like a local baker was one of the first people who checked out a dehydrator so she's dehydrating local fruit for her business and so and then she ended up buying her own dehydrator but she got to test one out and like in a pinch she had something that could do and, and just like that kind of symbiosis or synergy is, is interesting. And I, I don't necessarily know how to keep doing that. Um, and I don't want to work for a nonprofit. Like I, I don't want to have that as my job. Like part of my skill set, I think is I have energy and enthusiasm. Um, I <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I don't want to be tied down into like an obligation. So we'll see what, what is, I'm able to develop. And also I'm an outsider. We're outsiders in this little town. Yeah. Um, I can't like start going, Hey, let's do a transition town and, yeah. um, expect that to go over well. And, and, and I'm not really necessarily interested in that. It's just kind of a framework that, yeah people use but I don't want to be tied down into any one style I love hearing different people's visions for things they want to do particularly people who are you know different personalities for me because yeah, you, you've come up with stuff and I'm like that would literally never have occurred to me but that's such a good idea <laughs> you know and it's like yeah like with you you know connecting me with the bus and stuff like that's the sort of thing that I could follow, but I can't lead that. You know? hmm. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> As a couple, like Toby and I have joked over the years, we have like really low activation energy <laughs> and we, we can start projects and we can come up with ideas um, and not necessarily finish things. There's, there's some follow through that, that, that lags behind sometimes. But yeah, like I have five other ideas of things I'd like to do in this little town. And, and that's, to me, some of the beauty of living in a small community is that really one person isn't important. You can be really important and instrumental in good or bad um, or positive, negative, whatever the metric you want is. But like you, when you're in a big city, you, you're really just 
one of a million and but in a small town like I can make things happen I believe um, like I also want to start like a, a neighborhood fix it like just get people together on a Saturday we'll f spend a couple hours somewhere fix fix something of somebody else's home and then popcorn around mm. and have it be where it's you know, you're helping your neighbors, but then they're helping you and you you're building connections. Pool resources to fix someone's fence or something. Yeah. Mm. And um, there just seems like there's a lot of separateness that doesn't, like, isn't a great way to live, but people don't necessarily know how to do it differently. Um, and and that's one of the beauties of having more free time is that you can do things that aren't necessarily gonna make you money like i don't have to be focused on money because we have scaled back our need for money we're not uh, outside the monetary economy but like thinking of putting together a repair cafe like that could be a lot of work and I wouldn't necessarily, the benefit wouldn't be that I get paid to do it. The benefit would be that my community is stronger and that like less waste goes to the landfill. And it just is more interesting. I hope you enjoyed that. Stay tuned for part two of my conversation with Megan and Toby.